Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's Democracy Town Hall. I'm Olivia Zink, Executive Director of Open Democracy Action, and our organization was founded by Granny D, who walked across the country for campaign finance, which is why I wear her pin. Um, I want to thank you and welcome the viewers, as well as Executive Counselor Andrew Walensky um, for, the, for the Democracy Town Hall. Uh, we wish we were live with you all. Um, if you have questions throughout the night, please enter them into the Q&A section. We will keep questions focused on um, democracy reform. Um, I want to thank the co-sponsoring organizations for tonight's town hall, Equal Citizen, American Promise, New Hampshire Independent Voters, New Hampshire Ranked Choice Voting, New Hampshire Voters Restoring Democracy, Stamp Stampede, and Open Democracy Action volunteers and board members for helping put this um, series together. So I want to introduce Andrew Walensky. He is our current executive counselor in District 2. He has worked hard to get money out of politics um, and advocate for democracy reform, as well as um, he is a, an attorney in Manchester and a father and grandfather. I'll turn it over to um, Councillor Walensky to tell us a little bit more about him, why he's running for governor, and why democracy is important to him. Thank you, Olivia. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, today's actually a very big day in our campaign. Uh, we received two big endorsements, uh, one from 350.org um, for my stances against climate change uh, and for the environment. Uh, I'm the only candidate in this race who opposes fracking, and that's part of why uh, 350 endorsed us along with Sierra Club. Uh, Sunrise Movements and a number of other uh, environmental organizations. And then the other one that happened today is People's Action. Um, they are a grassroots social justice, racial justice, democracy oriented, money out of politics uh, kind of organization. And um, I'm really honored uh, to be recognized by both of them and they just happened today. Uh, so I am Andrew Belinsky. Um, those of you in New Hampshire uh, may know that I was the Claremont School funding lawyer. Um, I led a team of volunteer lawyers who exposed just how poorly funded, unfairly, unevenly funded our schools are in New Hampshire and how that results in a child's education really depending upon where she lives. Uh, if you want to talk about participating in democracy, having a strong, quali high quality, state funded public education is a key component of one's ability to participate. Not only did we expose the shortcomings in our state's school funding, we convinced the New Hampshire Supreme Court for the first time in New Hampshire's history to recognize a constitutional right to a state funded public education. Um, that was a bold idea um, but for lack of courageous leadership, we never really fulfilled the promise of those cases. And it is the need to improve our educational system that has led me to run for governor. That's the primary reason. Uh, the second reason, close second, is climate change. As Olivia mentioned, I'm a grandfather. Um, and I worry about the future we're leaving for our children and our children's children. Uh, and that's why I think the construction of fossil fuel infrastructure in, in New Hampshire, it's a fracked gas pipeline, $400 million that a utility named Liberty Utilities would like to build. Um, I oppose that fracked gas pipeline and my campaign has refused to accept fossil fuel money. Uh, we rejected it from day one. Uh, we're the only campaign again uh, that doesn't take fossil fuel money that distinguishes us. So relevant to democracy, I've been um, a voter protection lawyer for uh, more than 20 years. Uh, every campaign cycle before I got elected to be the executive counselor for District 2, I would be assigned one of New Hampshire's hotspots. Um, typically that was Durham where the University of New Hampshire is located or Hanover where Dartmouth College is located. And my job would be to protect the right of every qualified student to vote in New Hampshire. On election day in 2008, I was actually in court on behalf of the Obama campaign. 
So I come to this with a deep understanding of election law, a deep support uh, for the right to vote. Um, in my campaign, we at the very start uh, decided that there would be no campaign uh, corporate PAC money. Uh, there's actually a famous, somewhat famous, uh, video of me tearing up a $500 check uh, from a Fortune 100 company. Uh, it's a company that I didn't ask them to send me money. Uh, I don't know anyone there. The check just showed up. And then two weeks later, a contract for that company came before me as an executive counselor. Um, then I realized why the check came. And so on video, I tore it up. That's kind of a hard thing to do for a politician who's trying to raise money uh, to tear up a $500 check, but it was the right thing to do and, and we did it. Uh, my campaign has smashed through the records for the number of contributors to a gubernatorial campaign. Uh, partway through the primary, we have more contributors than any gubernatorial candidate has ever had through the entire election cycle. So primary and general election. I'm very proud of that. Um, we're running a, a straightforward, honest campaign driven by values. Uh, we're endorsed by Granny D's grandson, Lawrence Haddock, um, and by Ben and Jerry. Uh, and Ben and Jerry have named an ice cream after me. It's called Valinsky's Courageous Crunch. And that's because of my positions uh, with respect to campaign finance. So let me end there and let's move to the questions and we'll go wherever you'd like. I'm uh, focused in my campaign on reducing the reliance on the property tax, uh, which is in some ways a democracy issue um, because it ill serves the most hardest working uh, people in society and makes it hard for them to fund their schools. Um, but let's, let's see where your questions take us and I'm happy to go wherever you'd like. So most Granite State voters are sick and tired of big money interests that dominate our state elections. Um, how would you increase transparency on political spending, um, make, making sure that every group that's spending money to influence elections register and report? So let, let's start with the candidates themselves. Uh, New Hampshire has a campaign finance system, um, but it's almost like the Wild West. Uh, candidates have four years filed by sending a faxed small print list of their expenditures and their receipts of contributions, um, despite the fact that you can file digitally on the system. This is my third campaign. I've been elected twice to the Executive Council. Every single report we filed digitally, which means all of my reports are completely searchable. Uh, my campaign finance treasurer is my wife, Amy, who many of you know. Um, Amy's become almost a beta tester for this system. It is so infrequently used. So to start with, I'd, I'd strongly encourage all the candidates to use the digital filing system. And as governor, I would encourage the legislature to pass a law that anyone who raises or spends more than $5,000 must use the digital approach to campaign finance filing. Um, beyond that, I would do the same with the PACs uh, that spend money to influence campaigns um, and all of the C4 and other related organizations uh, from dollar one uh, need to use the digital filing system so that everyone can readily search, <clears throat> excuse me, across pack um, what they're spending and where the money comes from. Well, great, thank you for that. And we worked really hard several years ago to pass that legislation that enabled for a digital um, campaign finance. Um, my next question is around um, a loophole in New Hampshire campaign law, um, finance law called the LLC loophole, which allows companies to give $7,000 per company um, our law caps contributions to state offices at $7,000 per person, but, but many companies bypass that rule by using the LLC loophole. 
So what will you do to close the loophole and how will you ensure that this happens? So I, just a word on what the loophole is. Lots of real estate developers use a different LLC for every pop project they develop. That's not illegal, that's not inappropriate. But what they then do is the person who owns all of those LLCs multiplies his level of maximum contribution instead of it being 7,000 for one person, it's now 7,000 for each LLC controlled by one person. Um, Chris Sununu has been the expert at exploiting the LLC loophole. Uh, I'm afraid my colleague in the Democratic primary uh, used it as well. Uh, and when he got caught, he had to return more than $10,000 uh, that his campaign treasurer, a real estate developer had uh, contributed using the LLC loophole. I've never done it. I, I religiously avoid um, using the LLC loophole. Um, there has been legislation uh, before the legislature. Actually, Dan Beltis used to sponsor it. He didn't this last time in preparation for this run. Um, I think you can limit it by looking at who the members are of the LLC. That's another word for who owns the LLC and basically attributing each LLC contribution to the owner of the LLC and not allowing the owner to exceed the maximum. So if you wanna contribute through seven LLCs, then your contribution is 1000 each because you can't exceed the maximum. That's how I do it and I'd advocate for it as governor. Great. So one of the ways that we believe uh, every voice in the election would matter is to pass a public funding. And uh, some states have um, public funding um, in Maine and Connecticut, they have um, public funding through a model of a grant for participating candidates. In New York, they have something called a small donor match. And there's other pub public funding models that allow every voter to give the candidate of their choice $100 through um, what we call voter dollars. Um, do you support public funding and do you have a model that you prefer? Uh, having spent months raising money uh, to run an effective gubernatorial campaign, I wholeheartedly endorse public funding for campaigns. Um, there's too much opportunity for fossil fuel, for lobbyists, for corporations, um, to influence the process in a way that is not helpful for democracy. And that gives wealthy money in, moneyed interests outsized influence when compared to average working people. So I do support uh, public finance of elections. I, I tend to like the voucher model. Uh, I think it's Seattle that uses it the most prominently um, where registered voters are essentially given a a uh, chit or a voucher uh, for a particular amount of money uh, and they allot it to candidates in the campaign. Uh, and then there's a fund maintained by the either Seattle, the city or the state that's then transferred to the um, campaign for uh, expenditures to, to run the campaign. I, I like that model a lot because it puts a lot of uh, control in the hands of the average voter. Uh, and I think that's how we best protect democracy. Great. Um, because of our global pandemic, countless New Hampshire voters um, may be voting by mail for the first time this fall. Um, ex other states have experienced with vote by mail for the first time. Do you support a no excuse vote by mail system? Yes. Um, I was one of a number of people who've been pressing the governor, the secretary of state, the attorney general uh, to acknowledge that COVID-19 uh, is a valid excuse for absentee voting. Uh, there's been legislation uh, that the governor just vetoed, as a matter of fact, that would have converted our absentee voting system to no excuse. If you choose to vote absentee, you, you may. Um, he vetoed that we're still in an excuse-based 
if you're disabled, if you're ill, if you have a religious reason, et cetera. But we at least convinced for November and uh, September, September 8th is the primary, uh, that people can use COVID-19 as their qualifying uh, excuse. And I would encourage all the people on the call who are going to vote in New Hampshire to consider voting absentee. Uh, it'll be safer than standing in line at a polling place. Um, you can request uh, your absentee application for both the September 8th and November elections in one document now. Uh, that was just a, a recent change. That's an improvement. But you have to leave enough time uh, because you have to apply, get the doc, the ballot, uh, get the application, then get the ballot, send it back and forth a couple of times. So you need your, you need time to do that successfully. Your ballot has to be in by election day. Uh, postmark does not work here. Um, my uh, eldest son happens to live in Denver, uh, where it's vote by mail. Every registered voter. Uh, gets a ballot in the mail. There's no application process. If you're registered, you get it. That's the model we should use uh, along with a, a no excuse system. So you support every, every registered voter getting a ballot? Absolutely in the mail automatically. Okay. I, I want to talk a little bit about voter registration. Um, with town clerks closing in March, um, there were several months where voters could not register to vote. Um, do you support a automatic voter registration? So if you notify the DMV or other agencies that you have moved that your voter uh, registration is also updated? So uh, yes, and then you also have to deal with new registrants, uh, not just people who are moving. So um, here's where I differ with the governor. The governor says if you vote in New Hampshire, you have to register your car. I say if you register your car, where you get a New Hampshire driver's license and you're over 18, then you're automatically registered to vote. And that's how we should approach it. I think every uh, state agency where there's appropriate clerical staff should be a location where you can register to vote. So now it's town clerks and city clerks that are in the crisis only open sometimes. I think we need to expand that to DMV offices, to courthouses, um, some of the more administrative oriented state agencies can be locations where clerical staff can appropriately help you participate in the process of registering the vote. And 39 states plus the District of Columbia have a system of online voter registration where you can fill out your voter registration online. Do you support an online voter registration process? So uh, I do. Uh, but first, we have to bring our Secretary of State's office into the 21st century with respect to its online internet activities. The Secretary of State's office, for example, um, records the council meetings where the governor and the, and the council uh, make decisions on appointments and contracts, etc. You have to download Internet Explorer to listen to those recordings. It's an unsupported system with all kinds of security issues because it's unsupported. Uh, we need to upgrade that capability at the Secretary of State's office before going online under the Secretary of State's supervision. Uh, but those are issues we can solve. Uh, and once we solve them, I'm uh, a big fan of the idea of online registration. Um, so New Hampshire participates in a system called interstate cross check, um, which crosses our voter registration list with others. Um, this system is now defunct. The, the former Secretary of State of Kansas, uh, Chris Kobach, is no longer running that system. Um, do you, would you keep New Hampshire in interstate cross check, or would you withdraw us? And would you? There's also other systems that are more secure, um, at um, like Eric, the electronic voter information system. Um, so do you support uh, removing us from cross-check and how would you ensure that that happens? So um, an easy way to understand how I think is if Chris Kobach is for it, I'm against it. Um, and that includes the cross-check system. So we need to get out of cross-check and into ERIC 
One of the advantages of ERIC is that you can identify qualified but unregistered voters and engage in efforts to encourage them to register, um, plus doing the kind of cross-check function in a more uh, accurate and valid way uh, than the COVAX system does. Um, I think that we're in cross-check because Bill Gardner, uh, the Secretary of State, has signed up for that. Um, and my first effort would be to encourage him to switch to Eric. Uh, and if he fails to do that, I would support legislation that requires us um, to leave cross-check and move to Eric. Um, so for, for decades, lawmakers of both parties have um, participated in gerrymandering. Um, would, do you support an independent redistricting commission to end partisan gerrymandering? Uh, yes. Um, so the council districts are very, very badly gerrymandered. Um, mine being worst among them. It happened before I got there. I had nothing to do with it. Um, but in 2011, the legislature put Durham, Dover, and Keene into District 2, which I, I'm now the office holder for. They did that to make that district more democratic, not as a favor to the Democrats, but to make the other four districts more Republican. Um, it, it, we should not whether the Dems are in charge or the Republicans in charge, we should not be setting boundaries for state elected offices based on who's in charge. And I wholly support the idea of an independent redistricting commission to make rec recommendations to the legislature on how we should redistrict following the census that's happening now. So this will happen in 2021. Uh, the governor's vetoed that uh, legislation. We have one last chance to fix that uh, by electing a governor who would support independent redistricting, and I do. Great. And to the listeners out there, rem reminder to fill out your census. It matters for how your districts are picked, but it matters for so much more. Um, I just want to move on to ranked choice voting, um, which is a system that's used in Maine, but it's also a system that's been used by uh, municipalities throughout the country. Um, do you support ranked choice voting? I do support ranked choice voting, but I think you need to work to enculturate New Hampshire towards that approach. And I think the way you do it is by starting at municipal elections. Um, and so we get people accustomed to choosing more than one candidate for a particular position and ranking them appropriately at the local level in school district and town and city elections. We get people comfortable with that and then we move it to the state level. I'm a little concerned that people who aren't familiar with ranked choice voting um, may respond negatively if we just start all of a sudden on the state level. Great. Um, I want to ask a little bit more about the multi-member districts and floatarial districts that New Hampshire has. You talked a little bit about packing districts, but we also have a system where um, some of our districts are elected at large. So can you speak to your, your thoughts on multi-member and floatarial districts? Yeah, it, it's a way to violate one person, one vote. Um, so I live in East Concord, part of the city of Concord. Concord has 10 wards, and we essentially elect one state rep from each ward. Salem, which is qualif qualifies as a town, but has as many people as Concord does, doesn't vote by ward, votes all at large, and has a completely Republican delegation that is impenetrable because the majority of voters in Salem happen to be Republican and control all of the election. And I think if, if you did in Salem what Concord does and divided it into wards for voting purposes, you'd find a split. Uh, Concord is, is strongly Democratic, but we, rep we elect uh, one or two Republicans from the city very regularly because a couple of the wards happen to be Republican. Um, and that's the fair and right thing to do. Um, 
I spoke to someone actually today uh, who's from Deerfield. Uh, Deerfield uh, is a, I think, a floatarial uh, where there are three towns and everyone's elected at large for the three towns. Uh, it wasn't that way before 2010. Uh, Deerfield had its own representative and then you had a person elected at large uh, as well. I, I think we need to be more um, specific, more respectful of the votes of people uh, in places like Deerfield and Salem uh, so that people can really exercise the franchise and elect people who represent them, not be um, overpowered by majority rule in a particular uh, large, undifferentiated district. And throughout tonight's event, you've made a case for fixing democracy as an imperative. Um, so if you're elected, what would be the priority for you to fix our democracy? Um, and would you commit to a package of reforms like the HR1 at the federal level to, to fix these on multiple fronts? Or would you support individual pieces of legislation to fix that? I think there's a lot that needs to be addressed. Um, redistricting drives a lot of it. Um, and so allowing voters to choose their representatives rather than representatives choosing their voters is a really good start. And that should have a high priority. Uh, the transparency measures that we talked about uh, requiring candidates to use a digital searchable system uh, for their filings, also really important. Uh, closing that LLC loophole so that real estate develop developers don't have um, an enhanced oversized influence on how campaigns are financed, really important. Uh, moving us to, uh, I think it would have to start with a study committee, uh, moving us to publicly financed campaigns uh, would be a longer term goal, um, but we need to start on that right away. So the governor's primary um, tool is the bully pulpit. Uh, that and being the collaborator in chief. Uh, so bringing everyone along uh, to support these issues. Um, I think you start some of this with your inaugural address, uh, which happens right after the election, right after the swearing in. Um, and and supporting democracy uh, after you just get elected is probably a good idea. And it's a time when people are paying attention. Um, and so I, I would expect that my efforts to um, enhance democracy in New Hampshire uh, would start with my very first inaugural address. Right. So now we're gonna turn it over to questions from the audience members. So audience members can enter questions into the Q&A. Um, also, some voters submitted questions in advance um, through a form prior to this event. Uh, but I think I'm going to start uh, with Arnie Albert from Canterbury's question about how do campaign contributions influence how state contracts are awarded? Well, uh, they shouldn't. Um, but the governor's um, undertaken uh, an effort to destroy our constitutional form of government. I can't be uh, any more straightforward than that. Using his emergency powers during this COVID-19 crisis, he's cut out the legislative uh, fiscal committee, uh, which deals with off-term budget items. And he's tried to cut out the executive council, whose job it is to be a check and balance on his power. Having grabbed the power from these competing, rightly competing bodies of government, uh, he awards contracts uh, without bid to political insiders. Um, it was an effort that I undertook to keep the governor from taking any money out of the treasury until he revealed where the money was going, an effort to support transparency. That resulted in the revelation that um, he's been hiring political insiders to act as staffing agencies for healthcare concerns. So we have a number of hospitals that have just laid off tons of healthcare professionals 
And rather than going to those hospitals and giving them the contracts and supporting the, co the, the common good, the governor's gone to political insiders and given them half million dollar contracts uh, for uh, testing and telehealth. Uh, he hired a local uh, hotelier who's a big time Republican insider to rent ballrooms because he needed extra uh, office space for some of the contact tracing activities. That's all wrong. We should be participating in bidding. We can expedite it, but everyone should have an opportunity uh, to bid for contracts and to offer the best price and not limit this to political insiders. It's a real problem. Great. Um, Bob, Bob Perry uh, from Stratford says, uh, do you support using the CARES Act and some of the have a money to pay for prepaid postage for absentee ballots? Uh, yes. Um, the, the reason we have the HABA funds is to improve election processes here in New Hampshire, uh, and the secretary refuses to do that. Um, so we have, um, we have a need for postage for absentee ballots. We have a need to train and uh, um, recruit new election workers. Uh, many of the people who ordinarily staff our polling places on election day are older people who are at risk for COVID-19 and shouldn't be sitting there exposed to who knows what virus walks by them. Uh, there should be a, a broad recruitment effort uh, to supplement their efforts and to train those folks. That takes some money, some time, and uh, it's not being done. So uh, CARES Act money, HAVA money that's sitting there should get spent for those purposes. Great. Um, and the next question comes in from Gene Porter in Rochester and as governor, governor, what will you specifically do to ensure campaign finance reform? I didn't hear the last part of it, Olivia. What will you specifically do to ensure campaign finance reform? So, yep. Yeah, so to the extent um, I can lead by example, I'll show that leadership as I already have with respect to digital searchable filings, to the extent that I can publicly make known that my campaign doesn't take corporate PAC money, has never taken LLC money, refuses fossil fuel money, I'll take that leadership position. Um, beyond that, I'll have the bully pulpit as governor um, and we'll talk about the items that we've already mentioned a few minutes ago. And then I'd work with the legislature to pass a package of reforms that include redistricting uh, by an independent committee, that include requirements to use the digital uh, format that's searchable, to require um, that we go on record as a state in opposition to Citizens United. Corporations are not people and should not be treated as such and we need to be on record for that. Great. So that's how I'd start. Um, the next question from, the, from an audience member, Joanne asks from Hollis, um, how democratic would you say our selections of judges are? And is there anything you would do to change um, the way judges are selected? Can I say, hell yeah, I would change it. Um, under this administration, the Judicial Selection Commission, uh, which had been in place for a number of uh, administrations, um, balanced Republicans, Democrats, just people committed to getting good judges in place, smart lawyers, experienced lawyers who are ready to either move up to a beginning judgeship or promoting trial judges to appellate judges, that has been eviscerated by Sununu. He's put Chuck Douglas, a hard right Republican former congressman in charge and nothing happens with judicial selection unless Chuck Douglas approves it. We've had nominee after nominee who doesn't reflect the politics, the constitutional approach, the civics of New Hampshire 
come before us on the executive council. Uh, last summer, I led the effort to turn away someone who would have uh, legislated from the bench to undermine reproductive rights in New Hampshire. Sununu nominated the attorney general to be the chief justice, someone who's never served on the bench before, never even completed a jury trial, and had a 30-year documented history of antagonism towards reproductive rights. Um, I turned that away, but as a counselor, I have the ability with my colleagues to block bad nominations. It's really the governor who sets the agenda, who sets the example by bringing forward nominees. In my first term, in the last month, after we already knew that we would have a Democratic majority on the council who wouldn't approve any slapdash nomination that Sununu put forward, he put forward a lawyer to be a trial judge who had never conducted jury trials as a lawyer and who had a disciplinary record for violating the lawyer's codes of ethics. And during the confirmation hearing, I asked this fella, are, are you the best we could do? Um, and he took some offense at that. He's an insider politician, not a leading lawyer in the state. And that is exactly the opposite of how I would approach it. Great. The next question comes from Richard in Manchester, who's concerned about the unknown amount of money from energy policy groups, especially that uh, the Energy and Policy Institute found that the New England Ratepayers Association um, has close ties uh, to the New Hampshire Republican Party, um, but also has a lifetime legacy of climate science denial um, and has opposed many clean energy policies. So how will you address the, the problem of lobbying and campaign influence by some big energy companies? Well, you have to start um... I hate to say it, by removing the Sununu family from the governorship. Uh, the group you mentioned, New England Ratepayers Association, is staffed by two Sununu brothers, Michael and John. The Sununu family has a long history of climate change denial. Um, and let me tell you one of the things these folks tried to do. They tried to pass regulations in D.C. to federally control net metering. That's the process where you sell excess solar energy back to the utility. They wanted to set a price so low for that returned electricity that it could never sustain uh, solar uh, power in the US. And they wanted to do it at DC. They're a fake interest group. It's a small group of Republicans. They don't represent ratepayers. Uh, and they're trying to undermine the system of fair governance, of fair access. So we need to really focus on disclosure. Where's the money come from for this group? Uh, it's not disclosed at all. Um, it's part of the dark money problem that we hear about all the time. It's part of the Citizens United problem. Um, we need to go on record and change it. Um, it's hard to do that as a solo state, um, but we need to speak out against it uh, and talk about groups like this undermining democracy in New Hampshire and in other places uh, and push for a change on Citizens United. Great. Well, thank you so much for that. And Marsha um, writes um, that it's really not easy or it's easy to find or understand campaign donations. Um, how would you make our campaign finance reporting system more voter friendly? Yeah, it's, it's really complicated. Um, we, um, the system needs a redesign. Um, my wife, Amy, happens to be more the expert on this than I am because she's managed our campaign finances for three elections now. Um, but I've tried to use the system. Uh, first, the idea that people file by fax in tiny font is ridiculous, and we should call it out as offensive, number one. Number two, we can reorganize the system so that you can search 
across elections to see who's a long time contributor from a particular point of view. They can have the point of view, but we should know it. Uh, so does a particular lobbying group back candidate A in 2012 for governor and candidate B in 2014 and candidate C in 2016? That should be one database that we can search at one time. Um, and the searches need to be uh, readily transparent and something that is intuitive. Uh, the current system is, is not, needs to be, there needs to be an overhaul. Great, thanks. Um, I'm just trying to, we talked, we answered Steve's question. Um, there's a question that was submitted about the elect, uh, about the 28th amendment. So um, New Hampshire has passed um, more than 80 town resolutions calling to overturn Citizens United and New Hampshire became the 20th state um, calling for an amendment to the Constitution to overturn Citizens United, um, but our current governor vetoed that. Would you support um, overturning Citizens United through a constitutional amendment? Yes. Yes. Doesn't require more explanation. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Bill Brown from Hanover um, talks about what do you do you expect many people to vote by absentee and what percentage of the vote do you think will, might happen by absentee this year? You know, an election during the COVID pandemic is unprecedented. So we're all guessing. Um, I'm guessing that 30 to 40 percent vote by absentee and that would be a lot. Um, I think you will still have late deciding voters in the primary. Um, that's really what I'm think, focused on right now for obvious reasons, September 8th, remember to vote. Um, I think 30 to 40%, I think there'll be a lot of late deciding voters, uh, which will make it harder for them to go through the absentee process. Um, it's one way that if we had automatic uh, vote by mail, um, you wouldn't have to take steps early. You'd have the ballot come to you. It would sit on your kitchen table till you were ready to make the decision. Uh, and you can make it even fairly late. Um, I know where my son lives in Denver, uh, they have depositories that look like uh, mailboxes on the street corners. Uh, and so he takes our grandson um, and they walk to this voting uh, box and the grandson, he gets lifted up and he drops in the uh, ballot. We should have that here. Great. Tiani from Amherst asks, um, would you commit to keeping New Hampshire primary elections open to independent voters? Well, you're, you're talking to the guy who kept Bernie Sanders on the ballot in 2016 when he was challenged as being an independent instead of a Democrat. Um, I, I think independents have a big role in elections, particularly in New Hampshire, and I'm happy to commit to allow independents to choose which ballot they want, uh, vote, and then switch back to being an independent as they leave the polling place. I would be very much in support of that. Um, Elaine writes, do you think the Electoral College should be eliminated? Probably. Uh, I think it's an, uh, an anachronism at this point. Um, we, in a nation our size, uh, we're really not concerned with mob rule over elections, which was kind of one of the purposes of the Electoral College. Also keeping the slave states in a high priority position was one of the purposes of the Electoral College. Um, I, I think it's outlived its purpose. Great. So Sarah from Keene writes, 10 years ago, voting districts were created by a small handful of partisan politicians behind closed doors in private. Um, if we do not get an independent redistricting um, commission, do you support having transparency in how our maps are drawn um, so that voters can know the process um, and so that no 
Granite Staters should have to choose their poli or so that voting districts are protected and every Granite Stater has the right to choose their politician and make sure their vote is equally counted. Yeah, I think that was one of the more abhor abhorrent uh, aspects of redistricting, that it was done in secret in a back room, uh, I think across the street from the legislature. Um, we should do it as, we should have an independent commission first that does the redistricting um, in a fair and balanced way. They should make their decisions and have their deliberations in public, just as you would do a legislative committee hearing. And then the legislature, when it takes up those recommendations, should have that deliberation and discussion in public similarly uh, as you would a committee hearing. So yes. Great. Um, younger voters don't vote as frequent, frequently, and there are some burdens for younger voters to register. Um, what, would you, what advice do you have for younger voters about participating, um, and would you support lowering the voting age? Um, so I, I know this isn't ideal, um, but our children voted with us uh, from a very early age. Um, and we talked about who we were voting for and why. Uh, it's just part of the dinner table discussion uh, as far back as I can remember with our children. They're all now in their 30s and adults. Um, but I think you start there. You bring your kids with you when you vote. Um, I think the discussion needs to happen in high school. Um, and on college campuses about the importance of choosing your leaders, of making a difference, of doing it for the good of your community, not for your personal benefit, um, and selecting candidates that are um, consistent with your own values and the values you'd like to share with your community. So I think those discussions need to happen in school. Um, and then I think I would have to be convinced on lowering the voting age below 18. Uh, I, I think we need to show a stronger commitment uh, by 18 to 25 year olds um, before we can justify having the conversation of going younger. So Bev in Ware asks, um, how do you feel about candidate disclosure of stock ownerships and investments to ensure that there's no pre-existing relationships and your other thoughts on, on these sort of disclosures. Yeah, I, I like the idea of more disclosure versus less disclosure, um, but I don't like it when it's done as a political stunt where candidates say, if you don't disclose X, you're a bad person um, because they have nothing um, they have no reason to um, pursue disclosures against a different candidate. Um, so I, I think if you try and take a holier than thou approach, you demean the process of disclosures. Um, New Hampshire has a, a, um, a modest financial disclosure requirement, um, Amy, and it applies to your immediate family. Uh, so my wife, Amy, and I, uh, earn our income mostly from my law practice. I have a small uh, office building that I own with a friend and my wife who's a retired lawyer has a travel business. So we disclose all of that. Um, I think the standard, if I remember correctly, is any source of income more than $10,000. Um, so we disclose that. Um, great, the next question, um just scroll down here. Um, we started with a short discussion about broadband coverage and money in politics. Uh, can you re recap that for the voters that you joined a little bit late? Yeah. Um, so New Hampshire has a problem with spotty broadband coverage. Uh, it's particularly acute now that so many students were forced to go to remote learning. Uh, it really shows that there are communities that are left out of the modern era 
by not having good broadband coverage. Um, in New Hampshire, broadband is not treated as a utility. If it were a utility, you would have to provide broadband coverage for all of the consumers in that service area. Uh, and Olivia and I were talking about how some of the broadband providers uh, have actively worked against uh, broadband being considered a utility. Um, it makes me think of electrification um, in the Tennessee Valley Authority era. Um, my first uh, job out of law school was teaching uh, in Tennessee at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And so I, I was exposed to the uh, impact that the TVA made in electrifying uh, Tennessee and Kentucky and Appalachia. Uh, I think we need to undertake a similar effort to make sure that every family, every business that wants to be connected uh, to good, strong, working broadband in New Hampshire uh, should be able to do so. Great. Steve Rand from Plymouth writes um, about ranked choice voting. Um, and if a bill for ranked choice voting came to your desk um, as governor, would you sign it? And do you agree that ranked choice voting will improve the quality of our representation? I, I think there's a lot that goes into the quality, quality of our representation. Um, ranked choice voting can be an aspect of it. Um, paying state reps and state senators a living wage uh, would help a great deal. Right now at $100 a year, there are only certain people who can afford to spend the time as legislators. Uh, that limits the pool of representatives. That's one of the reasons why we have one of the older uh, uh, legislatures in America, uh, average age, because working people who go to a regular job can't afford uh, to miss work in order to be in the legislature and then earn $100 an hour, $100 a year, sorry. Um, so I think there are lots of things that go into improving the quality of our representatives. I would sign a ranked choice um, voting bill. I, I need to see the details. And I also want to repeat my earlier remarks that it's more likely to be successful if we incul enculturate voters towards ranked choice voting by starting at the local level. Great. The next question is from Kath in Peterborough. She asks about people who are homeless um, and struggling every day. Um, there's some uh, restrictive rules on making sure that they produce documents to show where they live. Um, what would you do, uh, especially around homeless individuals and their right to vote? Yeah, so I, there are ways that homeless people, homeless families, um, assert their domicile for school purposes so that you can register a child to go to school in a particular community, even though you happen to be homeless, living out of a car, living temporary from uh, home to home or from tent to home, uh, living in a campground. Uh, we've, we've already established that for schools. Uh, we can do the same thing. Domicile should be an intent. So if you intend to live in Manchester and you happen to be homeless at the time of the election, um, you should be permitted to vote there and you should be able to establish your domicile, your intent by completing an appropriate affidavit. Um, you should not be able to vote in more than one place, but if you're in Manchester, you intend it to be your domicile, uh, you should be able to vote there. Great. The next question is from Corrine and Derry. Um, as governor, would you support legislation for small donor citizen supported funded elections? Yes. Um, I think the voucher bills, um, the voucher, I don't want to confuse it with school vouchers, which are a bad idea. Election vouchers are a good idea and small donors tend to get there. Um, you, uh, you have some public finance system based on the number of small dollar donors uh, being matched. Uh, I think that's an appropriate, um, good way to finance elections. Yeah, we like to call it voter owned elections with voter dollar certificates 
to avoid the voucher <laughs> yeah. conversation. Um, so I'm just looking. There's a few other questions that I'm going to maybe roll into one because we're running out of time. Um, but can you weigh in about ballot deadlines and when voters should um, submit their ballot um, to their town clerk um, and how they should submit their absentee ballots to make sure it gets counted on time? Oh, yeah. So the deadline is election day. Uh, and so if you're voting by absentee, if you're voting by mail, you need to make sure that your ballot arrives in time. Um, there's nothing that says you can't physically drop it off. And we should make that easier uh, by putting a ballot box at the polling place where you can drive up and drop off your ballot in a safe way that keeps you um, isolated from uh, from people who may be exposed to COVID-19. I mean, the reason we have absentee voting for everyone now is to keep people safe. Um, that doesn't mean you should lose your right to vote because the mail gets held up. Um, so, but to be safe, um, I would return uh, my ballot uh, at least a week before election day. Uh, so that would be September 1st for the primary to make sure it gets there by mail, or I would drop it off. Um, most um, uh, town clerks and city clerks uh, will allow you to come in, complete the application, hand it over, get the ballot back, complete the ballot, turn that in right there. Now you've absentee voted and you're sure your ballot will count. Uh, so that's a good process. It's one where I would always be out of town on election day because I was covering Durham or Dartmouth, um, that's what I would do. I would go in a uh, couple of days before and fill out everything, turn it all in, uh, because I knew I'd be in Durham from six in the morning till eight o'clock at night, covering the polls, making sure every UNH student who was qualified got to vote. Great, and I'll just remind everyone the day before the primary this year is Labor Day. So make sure you are, if you're mailing it back, give yourself an extra day or two um, or hand deliver it by five o'clock on election day so that you're absentee ballot. But don't wait. If you're going to vote by absentee, request your ballot today. Um, so don't delay on that. And that, uh, there's still more questions, but I want to wrap up and allow, allow you to say some closing remarks to our audience tonight. And I want to thank you so much for being with us for this Democracy Town Hall. Well, but I'll turn it back to you for closing remarks. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you for the questions. Uh, very good ones. Um, I mentioned this at the outset, but we didn't really talk about it during the evening. Uh, access to a good quality education makes you a better informed voter. Uh, New Hampshire is 50th in America in its support for K-12 education, and it's in its support for college and university education. We need to change that. And to change that, we need to elect people who will take a hard look at our extreme over-reliance on the property tax to fund education. It's the most unfair and exclusive way of funding something as institutionally important, as critical to the success of democracy as education is. As a matter of fact, as, as I'm saying this, and, and looking at Olivia with the Granny D hat on, I'm reminded of the fact that Granny D marched with us on the 10th anniversary of the filing of the Claremont school funding lawsuit in 2001. We organized a march from Allenstown to the State House steps to encourage action to comply with the New Hampshire Supreme Court orders in that case. We didn't get it. That's why I'm running for governor. I really appreciate the time you've given me tonight. I hope everyone will vote absentee, do it early, and turn out for the sep September 8th primary. If you want to know more information about us, go to valinskynh.com. Thank you so much, Olivia. Thank you for this forum. Yeah, thank you so much for being with us. And I want to thank the Open Democracy volunteers and board that helps support this, as well as our co-hosts for tonight, Equal Citizen, American Promise, New Hampshire Independent Voters, New Hampshire Ranked Choice Voting, New Hampshire 
Voters Restoring Democracy and Stamp Stampede. Um, thank you all so much for participating in tonight's um, Democracy Town Hall and have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.